Chapter 1. Life sometimes sends us on a path that we never intended to go. Sulika Jalad was 22 when doctors told her that she had leukemia and her chances of survival were placed at 35%. For the next 1,500 days, she battled the disease with the support of her family and a team of healthcare practitioners. But it was not enough to just sur- survive cancer. She had to learn how to rejoin the real world despite being spent. After beating cancer, she realized the battle was still not over, only the field had changed. We often think that that life will give us whatever we want, but nothing prepares us for the unexpected. Joad's health experience shows us that life is not an experiment. There are some things we wish to do but cannot do because of of unforeseen circumstances. Her story demonstrates that we should not lose hope in difficult situations, but use the unexpected experience to create a better life for ourselves. What began as an, as an itch ended up being a cancer diagnosis. At first, she tried to self-medicate, thinking that it was nothing but an insect bite. Later, she started to feel extremely tired and sleepy for hours lo- longer than usual. Weeks after graduating from Princeton University, she was diagnosed with a rare form of acute myeloid leukemia. Everyone who is born holds a dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and the kingdom of the sick. Susan Sontag. Sulika Joad attended college on full scholarship. Her major was Near Eastern Studies, and she double minored in French and Gender Studies. She's been a high flyer since she was young, fluent in French, English, Arabic, Spanish, and Farsi. Joad is the daughter of a Tunisian-born French literature professor and a Swiss-born painter. In the following chapters, you'll find highlights of her incanceration, the multiple rounds of chemotherapy she endured, a clinical trial, and a bone marrow transplant. According to her, the hardest part was figuring out how to live post-cancer. Chapter 2. Life in Paris revolved around the subway, work, and sleep as opposed to the riotous experience of New York. Sulika Joad migrated to New York York City in the summer of 2010 after graduating from Princeton University, as most of her colleagues had done, and got an offer to work at the Center for Constitutional Rights as an unpaid intern. Since she wasn't wasn't from a wealthy family, the pressure for her to earn a living mounted. Months earlier, her body had begun to itch, but she chalked it up to a parasite. The situation worsened during her summer internship, and it began to negatively impact her work and life. Eventually, she chose to quit the internship in search of a paying job. This decision would take her out of New York for a paralegal position at a firm in in Paris. Before she left, she reveled in orgies and soirées. Of the men she slept with, one stood out, Will, with whom she felt a real connection. But had she not relocated to to Paris, their relationship could have evolved into something deeper. Life in Paris was a stark contrast to, to, to life in New York. For one, she lived in her own private apartment on Rue du Petit Tour. Her paralegal work was the first experience she would have working in a corporate environment. She had hardly spent a week working as a paralegal when she realized that she wasn't cut out for that kind of work. A soul that that needs to fly cannot thrive in solitude. Her correspondence with Will resumed to spice things up. She also made new friends in Paris, but things got increasingly intimate with Will that he eventually decided to pay her a two-week visit. Coincidentally, they found out that they had similar interests in journalism. At the end of the visit, Will made up his mind to relocate to Paris. Joy is a terrifying emotion. Don't trust it. Sulika Joad. Chapter 3. There is nothing more enjoyable than doing what you love with someone you love. Joad's various relationships ended for diverse reasons, despite being fully committed to those relationships. But things were different with Will. He was witty, clownish, and thoughtful. He was 27 years old while she was 22. Everything seemed perfect perfect between them. Will took up French classes and worked as a manny, a male nanny. 
Since he didn't have a work visa yet, it seemed like a good deal. Meanwhile, Sulika Joad's work was increasingly becoming un- uninteresting because she felt exhausted all the time. At first, she thought it was because the real world was too challenging. So she began to look for a job that was less demanding and more inclined to her interests. With the help of her old journalism professor, she was able to get a job at the International Herald Tribune. Before she could resume work, her health crisis had become critical. She had to be flown back to New York. To pursue your dreams, you need to have a clean bill of health. The itch had subsided since she moved to Paris, but the fatigue increased. Her first visit to a clinic was for birth control. But when the doctor reviewed the results of her blood test, test, he discovered that she was anemic. It didn't raise any major alarm at the time. She got her birth control pills and a daily iron supplement. Your appetite for knowing more and knowing yourself better makes you better. Sulika Joad, Chapter 4 Knowledge is power, and it is the key to achieving greatness. There were speculations about what might be wrong with her. Her father thought she had contracted HIV due to her sexual lifestyle. When her biopsy results returned, it revealed that she had leukemia. She finally got an explanation for her itch, the exhaustion and the mouth sores, but she decided to keep her diagnosis from people until until she was aware of its treatment. She contacted Will to notify him and was surprised to hear that he was coming to be with her. The news spread and everyone offered to help. They went to a cancer guru, hoping he would would help them cure the disease, but that didn't help. She searched the internet for information on the disease. When the full biopsy result came out, Dr. Holland, the doctor she met at the hospital in New York, told her that she had a a bone marrow disorder called myodysplastic syndrome. Myelodysplastic syndrome usually affects patients older than 60, and it's sometimes linked to toxic chemicals like benzene pesticides, and heads and heavy metals like lead. Adversity tests the bonds of love in more ways than one. Her love for Will grew stronger as he showed up during the worst moment of her life. Will offered to be her sperm donor since the doctor said she needed to freeze her eggs or create embryos before carrying out chemotherapy. She chose to freeze her eggs. The egg retrieval surgery left her with a painful urinary tract infection. Through it all, Will stood by her, and they agreed to be married. His parents visited her and supported her in their own way. Did you know? Immunosuppressants help the body to ward off germs. Chapter 5 Frustration and anger can be channeled toward achieving great success. The possibility of Joad's future became shrouded in doom with terrifying unknowns. She thought about the things she had lost and was and was losing. Her friends youth, and the life-threatening illness that she was battling. The only sense of normalcy she had was her relationship with Will. She advised Will to get a job with a view of strengthening their relationship. Anger and frustration that threatened to consume everything built up inside her as each of her dreams deferred. Her parents thought she was depressed and decided to help her as best they could. They suggested did she reconnect with old friends and socialize. She met a therapist who advised her to embark on a 100-day project. It involves carrying out time with your family to work on a creative project every day for 100 days, with each person choosing their own project. Will decided to send her daily videos from the outside world. Her mother decided to paint a ceramic tile a day that formed a mosaic she called Sulika's Shield. Her father wrote 101 childhood memories and and made them into a book for her. She decided to journal. The 100-day project enabled her to find her power as she grew past anger and fear and frustration with each day's journal writings. When going through a difficult time, engaging in a creative activity can help to lift your mood. Her medical team told her at some point that she needed a bone marrow transplant. Thankfully, her brother was a perfect match, but she was disappointed, knowing he would have to go through that pain on her account. People treat you differently when you are facing the possibility of imminent death, Sulika Joad. Did you know? A pharesis is a process of filtering stem cells from blood plasma. Chapter 6 It is 
possible to thrive during unfavorable and hopeless conditions. Joad was terrified at the thought that she would be another sad story of unrealized potential. The reality of her mortality made her decide to make every moment count. She decided to pursue something other than being a patient after one year in isolation. She started blogging. Her first post, titled, Good Afternoon, You Have Cancer, went viral and buoyed her up to make a second post entitled, 10, 10 Things Not to Say to a Cancer Patient. Write as if you were dying. We are all terminal patients on this earth. The mystery is not if, but when death appears in the plotline. Annie Dillard. Her blog caught the eye of an editor at the New York Times while she was waiting for her final biopsy before the transplant process. Despite not having previous experience writing a column for a newspaper, she was willing to try. After all, she had nothing to lose. She had a phone conversation with the editor where she suggested that a video series should accompany the writing to help those who may be too weak to read. She could feel herself becoming fierce as she got a job from a hospital bed. The column and video series dubbed Life Interrupted premiered on March 29, 2012, just days before her transplant. She wrote about her struggle with, well, with cancer, her infertility, falling in love while falling sick, and the thought of dying. In the face of imminent death, anyone can be motivated to do things they otherwise would not have considered. The transplant day was day zero. After a transplant, patients usually have to wait 100 days to be examined to ascertain the success of the transplant. It was 100 days of semi-isolation. Long hospitalization affects the psyche, and you start to feel claustrophobic after the second week. She began to forget things, and this was not good for her new job. She was grateful for the companionship of the, of the mails she got from her readers. She coined the term incanceration to describe her isolation after one of her readers, a death row inmate, wrote to her comparing time in solitary confinement with the experience of cancer, cancer patients. We were born needing care and we will die needing care. Sulika Joad, Chapter 7 Returning to normalcy after fighting cancer can be a tumultuous journey for everyone involved. On examination day, Joad got a piece of bittersweet news. The good news was that there was no cancer cells in her bone marrow, while the bad news was that she had a high probability of relapse due to, due to chromosomal abnormalities. This result means that she would need maintenance chemo that could last for more than a year. The sickness had taken its toll on everyone and they were yearning for a return to normalcy. Despondency filled the air, and Joad realized that maintenance chemo would be a solo run for her. The first move was to create stability by finding a place she and Will could call home. That place would be her mother's apartment on 4th Street and Avenue A in the East Village in New York. Transitioning from hospitals to the freedom of living in your home after battling cancer requires more mental strength than you needed in the hospital. Unfortunately, Will and Suleika couldn't muster the needed strength. Her parents had returned to their home in Saratoga, and the medical team was no longer at their beck and call. Will had had to take on those roles. The road to freedom meant struggling to keep food down, being patient with Will as he struggled to rise to the occasion, learning to share a bed with him after a long time of sleeping alone, alone in hospital beds, and being able to practice self-care. It can be extremely difficult to stick to the treatment regimen when the cancer is already in remission and all you're doing is preventing relapse. The road to normalcy saw Joad rekindling her love for saving stray pets. She adopted a dog that she named Oscar. Living with this dog brought fresh excitement that took her mind off the struggle with cancer. Despite the risks and the demands, she insisted on keeping Oscar. Will felt like his life had been put on hold to take care of Selika. Also, the sexual side effects of the disease took their toll on them. For a relationship that had been highly sexual, Selika found that she had, she had lost the desire for physical intimacy. Soon after their relationship became sour, 
and Will decided to take a break from it. From it. Conclusion Between, between Two Kingdoms describes the struggle between health and illness. Sulika Joad spent most of her adult life in the kingdom of the sick. Thus, she decided to build a little life for herself there. For her, the kingdom of the healthy was strange and scary. She learned that fighting a terminal illness does not spare people the pain and loss that bedevils normal life. She suffered Hufford heartbreaks, loss of loved ones, and other forms of pain while struggling to survive. The converse is also true. You can enjoy the goodies of life in the kingdom of the sick as well. She met new people that inspired her and were inspired by her. She got a job, a dog, and learned to love and be loved. While no one desires to be in the kingdom of the sick and strives to get out of it, the certainty of going there, going there at least once in this lifetime should challenge us to be equipped to handle the unexpected. Switching from one kingdom to the other is daunting, but most difficult is rejoining the kingdom of the, of the well after spending prolonged time in the kingdom of the sick. There are no treatment protocols to follow, no manual or guide to direct you on how to proceed. At first, you try to return to how things were. Soon, you'll realize there is no returning to the old normal. Then you try to create a new normal, but there are a million possible new normals to choose from, leaving you exhausted. In the end, you must fearlessly explore possibilities to determine what works for you. You've not come this far to fail. Dare to be free and live a full life. Try this. Unconditionally loving the people around you is the key to happiness. Seek information from the right source and don't rely on people's opinions. Show people their positive sides and don't add to their burden.